Okay, so last night's class was canceled, so I'm just going to do the lecture um, by video, and obviously you're not going to see me, but you will see the slideshow. So we're going to get started, and we're going to talk about the ankle tonight. Um, this quote, I love this quote, it's, to study the phenomena of disease without books is to sail an unchartered sea, while to study books without patience is not to go to sea at all. And I like that because it tells us that we obviously need um, to use our books for studying and for uh, gaining knowledge on things, but also just studying um, and using our books without actually having patience, we won't learn um, as much as if we uh, have a variety of patients to learn from. So as you can see, that's a really, really good ankle sprain. It probably ended up being a fracture or um, a dislocation of the ankle. Let me see. So ankle injuries. We're not gonna get into all of the anatomy, like I said before. Um, we do need to know that the outside of the ankle, um, so the lateral side, you have um, some important ligaments and they are the components of the external collateral ligaments of the ankle. So we have our posterior talofibular ligament, calcaneofibular ligament, our anterior talofibular ligament, our talocalcaneal ligament, um, our ATC, which is anterior talocalcaneal ligament. And again, the names aren't that important. Just know that um, we have ligaments that make up the lateral side. And then on the um, medial side, we have our deltoid ligament. We also have some um, tendons that run on both sides. Um, one is peroneus longus, peroneus brevis, um, and then on the medial side, we have posterior tibialis tendon. So, a fact. Let's see if we can see this. I think we, I used that one the last time. Ankle injuries constitute up to 12% of all emergency room load. A fact. Ankle sprains compromise approximately 14% of all sport-related injuries. That is quite high. Um, ankle injuries are very, very common and can take um, take place at you know at any time. Another fact: one ankle injury is anticipated for every 17 participants over a season. So again, quite high. 95% of isolated ankle sprains are of the lateral ligaments, so those outside ligaments. Why would you think that? Well, we have a few reasons why. This is just going into um, some of the ligaments um, that I just named, and we won't get too much into that. Let's see, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit about the why. So first we have an inversion ankle sprain. The sprain is dealing with the inert tissue. So like we said, inert tissue is ligament, uh, capsule, those types of things. The cause of an inversion ankle sprain. Well, inversion, internal rotation, and plantar flexion. Somebody going up for a basketball um, shot or um, you know jumping in volleyball, when they come down, they take a force in through their foot. Sometimes we land on somebody else's foot and we just do that quick turn of inversion, internal rotation, and, and we were in our plantar flexion position coming down. So again, here's to answer that question of why lateral um, ankle sprains are the most common. Well, first of all, our lateral malleolus or our lateral outside ankle bone, it extends further down than the medial malleolus. If you look there in, in the picture, you can see that, that um, fibular um, part of the bone there, the 
juts down further. Number two, stronger medial ligaments than lateral ligaments. So those deltoid ligaments on the inside are much stronger than our lateral ligaments on the outside. And our talus is narrow posteriorly. So that also makes us susceptible to an inversion ankle sprain. Signs and symptoms. Okay, well, we have different degrees of ankle sprains. There are three degrees of ankle sprains, first, second, and third degree. You can also look at them as mild, moderate, or severe, grade one, or grade two, or grade three. All those are the same. They mean the same. So in a normal ankle, you can see our ligaments look like that. In a grade one, a mild sprain or a first degree, we have a little bit of the ligaments are stretched. So you can see a little bit of red discoloration. Um, you know, it's one of those ankle sprains that usually you're able to walk off sometimes or, you know, it, it lasts for a couple of days. Not too much damage is done. Signs and symptoms, again, one, we have sudden uh, transitory pain. We have mild disability with local weakness, mild point tenderness, minimal hemorrhage and swelling, so not too much happens uh, in terms of swelling, and uh, just a slight stretching of the ligaments. In a grade two, a moderate sprain or second degree, we have a little bit more of a force going through that lateral um, side. We get ligaments, they're torn a little bit more, so not are they just uh, irritated or inflamed, we actually get a little bit of tearing in the, the ligament itself. Um, we get sudden prolonged pain, we get point tenderness, we get swelling, we get weakness, and we also get painful range of motion. And again, there's a little bit of tearing in, in the ligaments. In the third degree, we get um, more of an uh, inversion um, torsion happening. We get ligaments that are torn complete, completely through. So if you can see through in that video, in that uh, picture, we have uh, a complete tear happening there. With our signs and symptoms for this, we get sudden severe and constant pain, loss of function, generalized pain, swelling, and a complete tear of the ligamentous tissue. And with that one, because there's such a force that goes through the ankle itself, um, sometimes we get a dislocation where it um, goes into that inversion position and it stays in that position like this. You can see that. So just the same as a, a shoulder dislocates, our ankle can actually dislocate and stay in that position until it gets reduced. These are just some more pictures of when it happened. Um, that was of a volleyball player. Um, at UVic. You have to stabilize it just the same as a fracture um, and get them to the emerge. You want to make sure um, he's checking for like a pedal pulse down there just to make sure that uh, there is circulation going through into the foot. And again here you go. So we want to get um, x-rays on that just to make sure that uh, there is um, nothing happening. Sometimes you can get an avulsion fracture uh, where a little bit of the bone tears away from um, a little bit of the, the ligament tears a little bit of a bone of the bone away and that's again that is another um, dislocation really really bad uh, sprain obviously and probably a fracture here we go here we got another one all right so treatment for this well, we want to do our pier, which is our pressure, ice, elevate, and rest. Here in the, in the picture, you can see that blue, it's called a horseshoe. So we want to place a horseshoe um, on the inside and the outside of both ankle bones, just so that the, the swelling can, we don't allow it to pool down underneath the ankle bone. It helps to keep the swelling um, up and out. We want to obviously go through some um, rehabilitation and we want to get an x-ray. Well, when do we get an x-ray? Well, one general rule of thumb would be um, if the person has an inability to walk four steps after the in injury or in the eMERGE. If they can't walk four steps, then they definitely need an x-ray to see if there's anything else going on. 
How are we going to prevent ankle injuries? Well, we want to wear proper footwear. Um, we can use braces and taping procedures. We want to make sure um, we're running or walking on um, you know safe safe conditions, and we want to have good strength and flexibility, mobility um, as well in our ankle joints. So with a mild, our recovery time will be two days to one week, a moderate up to three weeks or longer, and a severe um, with the complete uh, disruption of the, the ligaments. Sometimes you want to be in an air cast um, four to six weeks or longer. So our next type of um, ankle sprain is um, a syndesmotic sprain, and uh, this happens with a dorsiflexion. Um, and also known as a dorsiflexion sprain. Um, some of you probably know that as a high ankle sprain. Um, it's caused by eversion, external rotation, and dorsiflexion. So the opposite of um, the inversion. We get higher ligaments, as you can see, higher lig ligaments um, in the interosseous membrane we get that being torn. So it's higher up, not down underneath the ankle bone, but up higher. We get tenderness between the tibia and the fibula and the interosseous membrane. Uh, we get a positive side-to-side -side test or Klieger's test. Um, what happens is because those, the, the structures or the ligaments um, that support those two uh, bones, the tibia and the fibula, um, because they are injured and disrupted, we get a widening of that mortise um, and we need to keep that closed. We get pain with dorsiflexion, again, because that makes um, those joints open up and with knee flexion. How are we going to treat that? Well, we want to tape it to prevent dorsiflexion. We don't want them to get into full dorsiflexion to open up and stress that um, joint. We probably will use a heel lift, and with a third degree, we will probably do some cast, get a cast, uh, and there might need um, surgery. And this is just showing um, the displacement um, and the opening of uh, the mortise, and then put the bone, the screws in here, and this space gets closed. An eversion ankle sprain, um, again, it's just happening to the deltoid ligaments, and then we can also get fractures happening with our ankle as well. And that's, again, just showing some post-operative um, procedures. So how are we going to rehab that ankle? Well, after the removal of a cast, um, or we get to a point where we can... Um, uh, do some rehab on it. Our aims would be, we want to, no, <laughs> not our aims, but what is going to happen to our ankle um, during the injury is increased swelling. We will have a decrease in range of motion. We have a decrease in strength, flexibility, and endurance. We have an increased joint stiffness, and we also have increased pain. The athlete um, may need to go into a whirlpool um, to get the swelling under control. Um, they may need, may need crutches. They may, may need ice. Um, they may need a walking air cast. Those are just a few of the things that they may need. What are our aims? Uh, we want to decrease swelling. We want to increase our range of motion. We want to increase our strength, flexibility, and endurance. We want to decrease any adhesions and make sure that the fibers are realigning themselves properly. And we want to decrease our pain. So again, what are, what are we gonna use to um, help us with this? Well, we're gonna use hot and cold tubs, uh, ice, heat, when you know the right time um, for that is applicable. We wanna give exercises and we want to use modalities other than the heat and ice. So in our ankle rehab program, our first stage, our aim would be to control hemorrhage, swelling, pain, and spasm. And how are we gonna do that? Well, we usually do that, that's an, our acute, our first stage is our acute um, injury. 
So we want to do that with pressure, ice, elevate, and rest, pier. So we go through our pain cycle. So we have pain, we have girding happening, we have muscle spasm and inflammation, we have restricted mobility, muscle weakness, loss of normal function, and of course we get angry, frustrated, and helplessness. That is our pain cycle for any injury. We want to do some proprioceptive training, um, things such as a wobble board, uh, 747 exercises, so that's like an aeroplane standing on one foot extending, reaching back with the other foot, um, just creating some balance. Uh, again, trampoline, just to offset our balance, just to get some proprioceptive um, training happening. And of course, in that picture, that one's a little on the crazy side, but yes, that is proprioceptive training. We also want to do some general body maintenance. Um, we want to maintain our cardiovascular fitness, so we want to swim or bike or do some cross training, um, something that's not going to be um, obviously you reusing our ankle but to give us some cardio. So some range of motion exercises. We want to do flexion, extension, inversion, eversion. We want to do maybe drawing the alphabet with our foot and maybe some towel exercises. These are just general things. We Obviously there are way more than um, things that we can be doing, but obviously everyone is different and uh, each injury is different, but this is a general overview of uh, things that you can be doing for the ankle. In our second stage, well, we're going to continue with our pair because that's important still. Uh, now we want to decrease our swelling. We want to restore full muscle contraction, and we want to restore full range of motion. So we're going to do this. Just some example um, exercises would be toe raises, Achilles stretching, and surgical tubing for strengthening. Here again are some ankle exercises that we could, could do. Um, I won't go over them all, but you can have a look there and see them all. In our third stage, if possible, have the athlete taped or braced, and now we're returning to functional exercises. So we're doing things like hopping, active walking and jogging, and running, figure eight running, um, lazy S. So, you know, those are just to stress the ligament in different angles. Uh, in the gym, just doing a great big figure eight, coming in, doing a smaller um, figure eight running. Cutting, stopping, starting, boomerang, running, and then doing sports-specific activity within your sport. This gets you ready. You want to make sure that you're ready to go back into play. We don't ever want to put somebody back into play if we haven't uh, tested them to make sure that they are able to do some functional exercises. Continue with many of the first two stages of, it, of exercises, um, such as stretching, proprioception, and strengthening. You. Uh, what you start off with in the first two stages, you are still going to continue uh, those into the last stage as well. And even when they are back to uh, full training, they still probably will want to do some of those exercises that they have been doing. So the athlete should progress from stage to stage as safely and as quickly as possible without pain and with a natural gait. All right, on to Achilles injuries. So we have Achilles, um, our Achilles tendon is shown here. We can also have a tendinal calcaneal bursitis. And a, obviously I went over with a, what a bursa was before, but it's a fluid filled sac. And if you get a bursitis, it's the inflammation of that fluid filled sac. With Achilles, we can also get a rupture or we can get a tendonitis. So tendonitis, um, tendons with synovial lining, um, that's called tenosynovitis. So that's when we get an irritation to that lining. A tendonitis, um, it's from an overuse, and we get an irritation just to the tendon itself. So again, we have Achilles tendonitis, Achilles tendinosis, Achilles tenosynovitis. So the cause would be overuse, so running hills. Uh, could be mechanical. Uh, such as you have an overpronation happening in your gait, in your walking. Could be the shoes you're using, um, high heels to a high heel to runners. Um, so you're switching back and forth. You might have a job where you need to wear high heels, and then obviously for training you're going to wear runners. 
uh, biomechanical. So you want to look at all those types of things just to find out what is causing our problem. So all this is saying is Achilles uh, tendono tendinosis versus Achilles tendinitis. So in the late 19, 1990s, um, they came up with trying to differentiate uh, between the two of them. So a majority of people with Achilles tendon pain, aside from those who had a, an Achilles rupture, um, have Achilles tendinosis rather than Achilles tendinitis. Achilles tendinitis is an inflammation, like I just said. The Achilles tendon becomes filled with inflamed cells. With Achilles tendon tendinosis, there is no evidence of inflammation, and also the injured area of the Achilles tendon has lost its normal glistening appearance. And the microscopic analysis of the collagen and related fibers that make up the Achilles tendon reveal that the cells are disorganized. Uh, degenerated and scarred. So it's more chronic. It's been happening for a period of time. So tendinosis versus tenosynovitis. Again, the tenosynovitis um, is a scarring that restricts the Achilles tendon motion within the Achilles tendon and sheath. Um, and it can, Achilles ten, tenosynovitis can also occur in parallel with or lead to Achilles tendinosis. Let's see if there's a picture here with that one. No, it's the same one. Okay. So signs and symptoms, tenderness and swelling, crepitus, which is like this crackling, um, uh, crepitus -y, like a, a, I call it uh, like Rice Krispies, that crackly uh, feel to it. Um, when you move the foot into plantar flexion and dorsiflexion and feel the Achilles, you'll feel that type of popping um, feel in in underneath your fingers and sometimes you'll feel a tendon nodule and um, in this this is obviously a drastic one you can see the total difference between this nice Achilles and this is nice and swollen and thickened well treatment again it varies but these are general rules of thumb you want to put a heel lift in so we want to keep them um, into a little bit more of plantar flexion. We don't want them to get into the last little bits of um, dorsiflexion so that we're not stretching the Achilles. We want to ice. We want to be doing stretching, strengthening. Um, you can take anti inflams We may need to put an orthotic uh, into the shoe. Uh, we need to modify or stop exercise, depending. Again, depending if you're going to a physician, you might have, be on medications, and depending on how severe, we might need surgery. So, it's really um, important when you have Achilles tendonitis to start an eccentric loading routine. Um, so, number one, we want to warm up the tendon by activity or modality. Uh, number two, we want to stretch our Achilles. And number three, we're going to do what's called a drop and stop exercise. So it's standing on a block or a step so the heel is unsupported. You raise up onto your toes and you allow your heel to lower as far down as possible. You want to do this in a slow controlled manner first, but we want to progress to dropping um, and lower, lowering rapidly. We want to perform three sets of 10 um, and progress as symptoms allow. And we, number four, repeat stretches and ice and then cool down. So again, we can go up on to two, go up on two feet and then slow or rapid drop down on one foot, as you can see in that picture. If you have an Achilles rupture, so an Achilles rupture, we get a complete, dis, um, a complete tearing of the Achilles tendon itself. If you see here, that is an Achilles rupture. The Achilles tendon totally severed. If you squeeze the gastrox, as you can see up in that picture, um, the foot is not going to go into uh, plantar flexion like it would if you normally squeeze it. That will cause your um, ankle or your foot to go into to plantar flexion. And this is just showing some of the braces that we may use if we have um, 
a, a lower uh, injury, lower foot injury.